continuing in the book of Galatians chapter 1. First of all, Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. God wrote a book. He wrote it accurately. He wrote it for our benefit that we might know him and understand our life and our position in the universe. I owe God a hearing. We're in the book of Galatians, chapter 1. Let me read a few verses for this. Um, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings? This is chapter 1, verse 10. Or of God. Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my, my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went to Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that I am, what I am writing to you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judah that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy and they praised God because of me. Key verse in Galatians, let me read it a couple times again, is chapter three, verse 11. I say key verse, there's lots of wonderful passages. We're talking about for freedom Christ to set you free, don't submit again to yoke of slavery, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, etc. Uh, great passages in God's word. But this passage, chapter three, verse 11, summarizes pretty much all that Paul is going to say, the point he's trying to get across. Because uh, these uh, believers, and they're believers, this was written to Christians in the Galatia area. That is central Turkey today. Chapter 3, verse 11. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith or by trust. Again, this is plain, this is evident, he says, when you look at the facts which Paul provides for us here in this book of Galatians. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God. Law such as the Ten Commandments. Law such as other you know, 600 13 total commandments in the Old Testament. It doesn't matter which one you try to pick and follow. The code of the law does not save. The code shows the perfect standard and that will never meet it. You have to go to the spiritual aspect of the Old Testament and find that you need the Savior and need to trust in him and God will provide the Savior. You don't have to provide it yourself. God will do that. So, People become people pleasers because they fear rejection. There's fear many things, as we've 
summarized it the last time, you know, you, you fear uh, losing some basic near need you have in life or uh, your sense of self-worth is threatened or perhaps uh, core beliefs that you have are challenged. And that brings up fear in your life, therefore anger, and you try to fight that off. Fearing man is a very large problem for people. Well, what if they don't accept me? Um, most people don't really care what you're doing. Most people aren't that concerned about your life. They're too busy thinking about their own life. And he says here in the 10th verse, that, you know, if I were pleasing men, I wouldn't be pleasing Christ because that which is acceptable and approved of man is an abomination to God. So, he says, first of all, I have to walk by faith. All believers have to walk by faith. And if we're trying to please people, we're not going to be pleasing God. And we have to understand that. So we have to take inventory of our own life and say, well, where do I stand here? Am I doing what's right or am I doing what's expedient for me? Jesus had the affirmation from the Father when God the Father says of Jesus, this is my son, with him I am well pleased. Verse 11, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. Men didn't make up this gospel, only God did. Men will make up some work system as they do with all religion and all cults, it's all about what we're doing. Or they will say, well, we're delighted, you know, that you, you trust God, but you know, you need to do these other things too for God to approve of you, uh, which is a lie. Uh, it is, salvation is the work of God for us. It is not the work of man for God. It's just the opposite of that. God found a way to save us in spite of the fact we're sinners by taking our sin away by the Savior. If you don't have the foundation right, nothing's right. You'll find out if your foundation isn't right, your life will never change because you'll be always one-upping one another. You'll be competing with one another. You'll be jealous of one another. You'll have infighting because when you understand that God does the work for us, you'll realize that this is grace, what God is doing, not works, what we are doing and you get to relax, you get to exhale and just settle in to your relationship with the living God. Now, the false teachers are coming in and say, oh, we're glad that you believed in Christ. It's a wonderful thing. Did you hear about this Old Testament? Oh, uh, no, we don't know anything about the Old Testament. Well, Paul didn't teach you the whole gospel. We need to fill in the gaps for you. You not only need to believe in Christ, but you also need to follow the Old Testament laws to be acceptable to God. You men will have to dedicate yourself to that and be circumcised as the sign that you're under the Old Testament law. And they bought it. They said, well, there is wonderful things. You're right, there's some wonderful things in the Old Testament. And they were teaching many of the different stories and, and principles in the Old Testament, I find. Uh, but that's not salvation. Salvation is by faith alone and Christ alone. Simple as that. This is a life-changing book. Uh, this book just lines out completely that there's nothing we can do, nothing we can say, nothing we can accomplish that's going to gain the approval of God. Now, when we trust what he did for us on the cross, then we have eternal life. And that's the point of eternal life. The message of the gospel is very narrow in scope. And that scope is Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and he rose from the dead. Now, he died for our sins. You know, there's three hours of the six hours he was on the cross. That there was pitch black darkness. There was no cloud covering the light. God just turned the light out. And he was started to bear every sin of every human being who has ever lived or ever will live. God and his omniscience knows everything. And he put all the sins on Jesus Christ. And Jesus was separated from God for those three hours in spiritual death, which he suffered for us. Instead of us 
paying for our sins eternally. He did it on the cross once for all. And then he was buried, which means he was a real human being. He was the God-man, Jesus Christ, which God can't die on the cross, God can't die, he's eternal life. But Jesus could, and Jesus could bear our sins of the humanity. He's the second Adam. The first Adam failed, the second Adam succeeded. And he was physical. He wasn't some spirit hanging there, an illusion or whatever. He physically was buried and then he rose from the dead as the last part of the gospel. He physically rose in a physical body forever to be the God-man, Jesus Christ. Now, that's the message of the gospel. And if you're baptized or if you join a church or if you do a lot of benevolent things for people afterwards, oh, that, that's fine, but that's not the gospel. That's not how you're saved. You can never go to heaven and say, well, look what I did. As I've shared before in Matthew 7, when uh, on the judgment day when unbelievers are before the throne of Jesus Christ, and he is their evaluator and eternal judge. And they say, Lord, Lord, haven't we done many marvelous things in your name? We prophesy, we preached many sermons in your name. Uh, we uh, went out and did so many good things. Uh, we cast out demons. Uh, we, we did all these things in your name. And then he says to those unbelievers, uh, which is to say there are many preachers that are going to end up going to hell because they weren't believers. They were just religious types. And then he will say to them, depart from me, you evildoers. I do not know you. There's no personal relationship. Personal relationship starts when you trust Jesus Christ as your savior to take care, that he is taking care of your sins and he can get you into heaven by his work. That's the beginning. That's the new birth. Uh, and you can't add anything to it. Now, there are always churches that say, well, do this and do that and do the other. Uh, and there's lots of things that God has in mind for us to do after we're saved, after we're saved, not before or during our salvation. It had nothing to do with that. We're saved by grace through trust. And this has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with the one who's called the Savior. We're not Savior. He is. So as it says here, you know, uh, I didn't receive this gospel from human beings. This is a divine origin. God planned this for us. All religions, all cults are about man reaching up to God with their wonderful good works and their nice life. But the gospel, the good news is God reached down for us and pulls us up to him because of what he did, not because of what we do. Now, after I'm saved, God has a plan for my life. God has a plan for every human being. Uh, and a believer wants to uh, trust Jesus Christ as Savior. God gives them spiritual gifts. God gives them a plan. He orchestrates things that are preordained for them from all eternity past. So it's not human origin. And Paul says, I didn't go ask a human being about this. Well, how does all this work out? I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ revealed to me. I was a big worker. I was doing so many works for God. I was going out and killing people for God. And Jesus revealed to me, that's not how you get to God. I was zealous. I was zealous for God. But it was zeal without knowledge, which ends up being dead works. No human, but I received the revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ from God. He revealed to me what it was. Verse 13 for you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. Uh, now, that's a religious worker. There's no question about it. There's a religious man trying to please God to the nth degree, going so far as to kill people 
who he felt were on the wrong side of this story, that uh, they weren't doing right what God would want, and so I'm going to eliminate them. And yet he got the gospel. He had heard the gospel. He, he witnessed a, a living testimony uh, from Stephen, who he watched being stoned to death for his faith. I tried to destroy that type of belief. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. This is one of the problems Paul had. He was zealous for traditions. Many people have lots of traditions and some are in the name of Christianity, some are in other whatever. But these are things that people have made up. Uh, it's kind of like when I have a wedding ceremony and, I, and we're discussing the ceremony and I say, there is no wedding ceremony in the Bible. God did not line out a wedding ceremony. Wedding ceremonies are, peop are what people have invented so they can make a public statement to everyone around, we are for each other. We are separating ourselves strictly for each other. Fathers would do this, mothers would do this. They wanted their daughters to be protected and they had a public ceremony showing that they are committing themselves, that this couple is committing themselves together. But we have made all kinds of wedding ceremonies. So if you're married by justice of the peace, is that legitimate? Yes, it is. Uh, how about a common law marriage? Well, yes, that's legitimate. Uh, we don't particularly like that. We think that's kind of off, off in the way, but no, it's legitimate. What if... Uh, you got married by someone who is a false teacher. Well, it, the marriage is still legitimate. But that's a tradition. Many people feel you have to have a church building to be legitimate. Well, Christianity for over 200 years didn't have church buildings. Uh, they just rented a place that mainly met in people's homes. Today, most of Christianity today meet outside of church buildings. They meet in people's homes. They meet out in courtyards and whatnot because anyone who believes in Jesus Christ the Savior is the church. Buildings are not the church. But many people believe that you have must join a church. Now, joining a church uh, may have some uh, legal ramifications. Someone has to be responsible for buildings and whatnot. Uh, but it's no spiritual issue because when you believe in Jesus Christ, you are the church. Now, then you're told you need to get together with other believers. You need to take in the word of God. You need to help and encourage one another as you're going down this path, uh, shoulder to shoulder in the fray. But many of the things that are dreamed up around it, like, crawling up steps to show your, your how uh, repentant you are, uh, kissing a statue's toe or someone's ring or confessing Christ publicly, even if you have a great fear of public speaking. Now, all that stuff is peripheral. That is stuff that people have made up. It's the traditions of man. And many people make the traditions of man more important than the word of God. Robinson Crusoe, a story written about a, a man uh, on an island and um, nobody else around, but he finds it. It's a footprints and he tracks a guy down and he finds this man, a native there, and uh, call him Friday. And uh, he helps Friday learn to read the Bible. He has a Bible. And without any church, without any preachers, without any ecclesiastical authorities, without any approval, this native man finds Jesus Christ as a savior with nothing but the word of God and the testimony that God gives. And that's why that book was written, to show you don't have to have all this stuff around to find Christ. So Paul was intent on the traditions of the elders, the traditions of the Jewish people. 
And many times what the Jewish traditions were became far more important than knowing the word of God. And that's a great problem today, just as it was back then. I was zealous, not for the scriptures, it doesn't say that. I was zealous, end of verse 12 there, or 14, excuse me. I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But there's a great conjunction of contrast for Paul's life. When God, who set me apart from my mother's womb, in eternity past, God knew that if he gave Paul the opportunity, Paul would believe in Jesus Christ as Savior. Even though he had to fight through all the traditions of man and all that kind of stuff, that if he gave him a chance to know Jesus Christ, he would. So, in eternity past, God made a plan for Paul. That's true of every believer. God gives everybody a chance. But when he sees that when given a chance, a person will believe, he makes a plan for them. A billion years ago, before the earth was even formed, he made a plan for their life. So every believer has a plan for their life. Set me apart from my mother's womb, called me. Called me is when he believed. The message was given to him on the Damascus Road, and he said yes. He had said no before. He heard from Stephen. He heard from others. He heard from many believers that he voted to put to death. But this time he said, yeah. Called me by his grace. He didn't say to Paul, Paul, you're such a wonderful man. You're doing so many good works. You're trying real hard. I'm going to let you go to heaven. He didn't say that. The unearned favor and kindness of God gave Paul eternal life. was pleased to reveal his son in me. Oh, that's a good, just that one little phrase, you know, in me. Because you can know the historical Christ, okay? Historically, we know Jesus lived. He was crucified by Pontius Pilate. Uh, he has been testified by people that he rose from dead and his followers went to their death before they denied the truth. That's historical. Anybody can say, oh, Jesus Christ, he's the son of God. But do they believe that? Is that a part of their life? Because you can know him outside. You can know him intellectually. Even the demons believe in God and they shudder. And you can believe in him intellectually, but have you made him your savior? Have you said, yes, I trust Jesus Christ as my savior? That's when he is real in you, in your heart. To reveal his son to me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. That's the plan that God had for Paul, that he would reach many, many Gentile people. He knew the word of God very well. Uh, he was very skilled in the word of God, uh, but uh, he needed another ingredient, the Holy Spirit, to teach him how it relates to the Savior, Jesus Christ. My immediate response was not to consult any human being. Okay? Let me go talk to all these uh, humans who already believed in Jesus Christ and see what they say about this and what their opinion is. No, none of that. I did not go up to Jerusalem, up elevation, up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before me. And that many people would say, well, I need to talk to a preacher about that or I need to talk to some famous Christian about that. And, no. and they may be famous for something other than spiritual. So you can't trust that. Who are apostles before me, but I went to Arabia. Now this is how it worked out for Paul. He goes into Damascus, uh, Ananias says, um, he, and of course, for three days, Paul's been blind and he's been thinking about his wasted life and meeting Jesus Christ. And he's already a believer. And Ananias uh, comes to him and says, uh, uh, Brother Saul, he's already a believer. Uh, puts his hands on him and says, receive your sight. 
and he did receive his sight again. He says, rise and be baptized. That, that's, if anything, that is almost an initiation. I'm saying, I'm all in. Yeah, I'm a part of this. And uh, then he started going into the synagogues and teaching that Jesus Christ is the Savior. Now, he had many challenges and many people asking him questions, and there's a lot of them he couldn't answer because he hadn't oriented himself to this Jesus who is in all of the Old Testament spoken of. And so he went then and left and went to Arabia. And in Arabia, he went to Mount Sinai area. And there he was sustained. And there he was shown the videotape, so to speak, of uh, Jesus Christ's life. Then he understood how he could apply the life and the teachings of Jesus Christ to the Old Testament and to today. And he went back then to Damascus, three-year absence. He went back to Damascus. He started teaching the synagogue, and he overwhelmed everyone with his knowledge. And the most learned of the people in the synagogues were absolutely frustrated with him because they couldn't deny what he said was scriptural. And it was the truth of the word of God, but they didn't want to believe it. They were like he was before he was a believer. And so they politically got the king to uh, get his man arrested and assassinated, uh, executed. And so they had guards at the, the city gates so they could arrest Paul and they lowered him in a basket from the wall. Uh, his friends lowered him in a basket down and then he went down to Jerusalem. That's where we pick it up. Later, I returned to Damascus. Okay, that's where he taught. Then after uh, three years, I went up to Jerusalem. So from the time he was saved to the time he did go to Jerusalem, there's a three-year span here, summarizing it, to get acquainted with Cephas. Cephas is the Aramaic name for Peter. And stayed with him 15 days. So they had a good fellowship time. They got to know each other uh, in each other's ministry, and they got to talk about what's happened to them and whatnot. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. James is the half-brother of Jesus. Mary and Joseph, after Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph had at least uh, six other kids. We don't know how many. It says sisters, plural, so we're not, we know at least two. And they named the other brothers of Jesus. They'd be half-brothers. They're the sons of Mary and Joseph, whereas Jesus was just the son of Mary. Uh, there was Joseph Jr. was one, James, Jude, and Simon, uh, like Simon Peter, but a different man, a brother. Now, and one of them, James, became a believer. They all, by the way, all the family became believers after his resurrection. We see them in Acts chapter one in the upper room praying. And um, James became uh, the leader of the Jerusalem church. He's not even an apostle. He's not an apostle. There were 12 apostles and the 12th was, was Paul. And James became so skilled in the word of God and such a man of God that everyone, even Peter recognized him as being the leader of the Jerusalem church. They would go to him for his final say on things that were difficult. Now, many have, in history have called James um, uh, camel knees because he spent a lot of time in prayer on his knees. And he was hated greatly by the religious leaders, uh, but loved greatly by believers and trusted. Uh, he was eventually murdered uh, by the religious crowd, uh, but he served faithfully in the time given to him, in the job given to him. So, I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that I am writing, what I'm writing to you is no lie. This is the straight facts. And Paul sticks with the facts. When I went to, to, then I went to Syria and Cilicia. Now, Syria is where Antioch, very famous uh, Roman city, 
Um, and Cilicia, he's from Tarsus, and that's the Cilicia area. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The one, the, form, the one who formerly persecuted us is now preaching this trust in Christ he once tried to destroy. This is a changed life. Now, the whole point of what Paul is saying is here is, I didn't think this up. I didn't dream this up. I didn't consult with some people and work out something. Uh, this information about salvation was given to me by Jesus Christ. When I did meet others, they confirmed it's the same gospel they have. We'll see that in the 15th chapter of Acts because a crisis comes. These type of people were going behind Paul and trying to sway people away from uh, walking with Christ and start to work and work their salvation, work for their salvation, work for all kinds of stuff. And so they had to go to Jerusalem and say, okay, let's all talk about this. What is the gospel? Thousands of people have come to Christ under Paul's ministry. And he wants to say, have I missed something here? Do we need some works added to it? And they all agreed on the, per the last person who gave his opinion was James. He said, this is it. They are saved by faith alone in Christ alone, just as we Jews are saved by faith alone in Christ, in Christ alone. And the whole book of Galatians is about that. And the result of a life saved by God's grace means a changed life. The result to others means many thanksgivings to God, many people praising God, glorifying God. Look what God has done. You can always tell false from uh, the true gospel from false gospel. People get praised, preachers get praised, uh, notable people, uh, notable in, in man's eyes, get the praise. And there's one upsmanship and competition and whatnot. Uh, but when it's of divine origin, God gets the praise. And that's the way it should be in our life. All praise, glory, should be to our Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of mankind, the only one who can get us out of hell and into heaven. And he did so by his work on the cross. And we just trust him. And he takes care of the rest. Okay.